All right, starting the broadcast in three, two, one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mel Grills. Uh, I'm the chair for the Contractor Common Interest, Interest Group, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on Audit Scheduler Manager. Uh, Dr. Bob von Vermouth will be presenting this, but uh, wanted to bring everybody up to date on what's coming up in the in the near future. What the Common Interest Group is offering, uh, we've partnered with a number of our uh, IA partners, uh, specifically Ewing, Toro, and Rainbird, uh, here in the next couple of weeks to offer webinars on what products they offer that have a technical advantage over uh, what may be out in the field. As technology improves and advances, uh, we can save water, we can save time, and we can work a lot smarter if uh, we have more tech-savvy products in the field. And, and so I've uh, asked the IA if we can work with the uh, distributor, or excuse me, the uh, manufacturers to, to show what they've got to offer. And uh, so up in April on the 30th, uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, Ewing is going to be offering their tech webinar to highlight some of the items uh, across their inventory that they uh, see as the most tech savvy. Uh, in May, we're going to have Toro offering a webinar on the 8th from 2 to 3. And then on the 22nd, we're going to have Rainbird offering uh, their webinar from 2 to 3 as well. Uh, Hunter was uh, had some other obligations. They ask if they can be pushed later in the year. So we've got uh, September the 12th from 2 to 3 offered for them. So uh, make sure to stay tuned. And, uh, and we'll be sending out invites to this, these webinars. And please try to set some time aside to uh, participate and see what you might be able to put in the field that is not currently out there. Um, we There's a lot to cover, and I know that there's going to be a lot of questions, um, but I want to first uh, introduce Chad Forsey, uh, our State Affairs Director. He's got a couple of points that he's going to bring up, and then he's going to introduce Dr. Bob. So let's go ahead, Chad. Thanks, Mel. Good afternoon. My name is Chad Forsey, and I'm the State Affairs Director for the Irrigation Association. And I want to start out today by welcoming you and thanking you for participating in our webinar today. And we're going to get started in a minute. Before I introduce Dr. Bob, Bob, Bob or Newt, I would like to mention that we've got some events taking place at the Irrigation Show this year in Phoenix, Arizona. And we will be featuring our point of connection sessions on the show floor and also off the floor with sessions on the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st. The 21st will be our point of connection long session. And we're working on uh, getting our speaker booked at this point. We'll be announcing that later. But I just wanted you to have those dates available in front of you from the 19th to the 21st of November. I know that's way off. But just uh, be thinking about coming down to Phoenix, Arizona, and participating in our contractor education sessions, our point of connection events. So now what I'd like to do is introduce Dr. Bob von Bernuth. Dr. Von Bernuth is Technical Advisor for the Irrigation Association and Professor and Director Emeritus of Michigan State University. His portfolio includes 10 irrigation manuals used extensively in the irrigation industry and more than 150 technical articles. He holds degrees in engineering and an MBA. Dr. Von Bernuth's irrigation experience began as a young man irrigating on the family farm in Colorado. He is a registered PE, CIC, CID, CIT, and CLIA. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bob von Bernuth. Thank you, Chad. I assume everybody can see my screen now. Um, this afternoon, we're going to talk about a an Excel uh, software package that we've modified uh, to add a few features uh, called Audit Scheduler Manager. The Audit and Scheduler portion of this software package have been around for a long time. And uh, recently, we added the manager part just to help you try to visualize what might be some of the effects of managing a system that you have audited. OK. 
Okay, come on. There we go. Um, first of all, we're starting with the assumption that we've done an audit. So why do you do an audit? You gather information in order to determine if the system is operating properly. So in addition to have done, having done some uh, field checks and pressure checks, make sure all of your systems operating right, sprinklers are properly oriented, adjusted, nozzled, all that sort of stuff. Um, we're going to use the data that we gather from this audit to create an irrigation schedule. And then we're going to use this software package called Audit Scheduler Manager to see what are the effects of management decisions that we might make regarding this system. Now this spreadsheet is intended to assist a person who's already done an audit. And the assumption is made that the audit was done right and the catch can devices have been properly spaced. And the other thing in the manager part of it, we assume that each can represents the same fraction of the total area. Uh, that's sort of the disclaimer that an ex-professor gives you. Uh, statistically, it's important. Uh, from conceptually, it's really not so important. The catch device placement, when I'm talking about they're being equally scheduled or and equally spaced, uh, these were placed in an irregular area, as you can see, this sort of uh, what kidney-shaped thing, um, with the catch cans spaced on a grid, equally placed, equally spaced. Um, one of the important statistical features that we look at is distribution uniformity low quarter. And I'm assuming that everybody who's in this seminar is familiar with this, so I won't spend a lot of time. But the distribution uniformity lower quarter is the average water applied to the 25% of the area receiving the least amount of water divided by the average water applied over the entire area. So basically what this thing does is it gives emphasis to the low quarter or the area that gets the least amount of water. There's the equation that you would use to calculate the du low quarter, where you simply do, as I said, uh, the average catch in the low quarter divided by the average catch overall. What it looks like in terms of a field test, in the top half here, if you can see my arrow, you see that we've, cat, we've caught water in these collection devices. And then down below, we've rearranged this. For simplicity reasons, we only show eight catch cans, but we recommend that you do 24 or more catch cans on your area. The low quarter, shown over here on the left, and increasing order to the right, um, where you see then on the right there are two that are above average, and on the left, the low quarter is below the average. The average overall here is 75 millimeters, and the average of the low quarter is 63. That gives you a DU low quarter of 0.84, which, by the way, is a very good DU. That just says what I already said. It follows directly, that is, this DU low quarter, from rearranging the catch cans or the catches in order. And I want you to sort of visualize the rearranging of those catching catches in order, because later in the seminar, I'll show you how that's significant in the management part. Now, it's kind of a pain in the neck to do that if you were to do it manually or if you did it in just an ordinary Excel spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet allows you to input the data in the order that you took the readings from the cans, and then it internally rearranges it for you. Um, it doesn't actually show it to you, except it does in the graph. The example that I'm going to show you uses 32 catch devices. You can use any number in this software package, and it will calculate the numbers for you. But we recommend that they be multiples of 4 and a minimum of 24. So what kind of a DU would you expect to get? Depending on the kind of sprinkler, whether they're, and we're talking about landscape sprinklers now, of course. Um, if they're rotary sprinklers, we think it's achievable that you can get in the 0.75 to 0.85 range. Uh, your target ought to be 6.5 to 7.5, but
but historically we've seen some really low ones. Spray, not quite as good, and historically we've seen that they might be down to 0.45 or 0.55. Later I will show you the significance of those DU low quarters when it comes to how you manage the system and what sort of an efficiency you can expect from your application water. We recommend that if you get a, low, a value lower than historically shown here, that you consider system improvements. Look and see what's wrong. Do you have missed nozzles, mismatched nozzles, zones not properly operating, um, under pressure, over pressure, find the problem. OK, now, because there is non-uniformity in the water applied, we may need to adjust the amount of time we run the system to help um, supplement the water to the areas that get the least amount. Now, soil moisture uniformity is higher than sprinkler uniformity as measured with a CAT scan. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to put cans above the surface, catch the water in it, measure the water. But what the plant sees is the water that's in the soil. And the wa there is some lateral movement of water in the soil by capillary action. So there is some minor redistribution in the soil that makes it a little bit better. And um, that helps us determine how much extra water might be needed. Now, some of you out there might think, well, gee, would we adjust the amount of additional water we put in for the soil type? Uh, and in fact, I suppose technically, that's a good point. We don't do that. But what the plants care most about is the soil moisture. It's the water that, they, that their roots can get to. The scheduling multiplier is used to incorporate the uniformity into the schedule so that we can adjust the amount of water in terms of inches of water or minutes of run time uh, for non-uniformity considerations. And the scheduling multiplier is calculated using this equation. Now, in the software, it's done for you. And if you're looking at the Landscape Irrigation Auditor manual, there is a table. So if your equation is averse, you don't have to worry about that. We'll do it for you. But this says that the scheduling multiplier, which will always be a number uh, greater than 1, um, says, uh, given the DU low quarter distribution uniformity as a decimal, how much you would increase so that you increase your run time. The Excel spreadsheet does the following things for you. It allows the user to input the data. So you put data in about the site, uh, the catch devices, uh, your can catches, some soil information, some ET information, and then it does the hard work for you. Uh, most important in this are the catch test values or the can catch test that you have, your run time, the catch device information, which includes the cross-sectional area of the top of that device. And that's very important when it comes to calculating the precipitation rate and information about the site. It then calculates the DU. It calculates the precipitation rate. DU is used in the scheduling multiplier. Precipitation rate is used in determining how long we run the system. And it helps you develop a schedule. And then the latest part, the manager part over here, it shows you what happens if you make some management decisions. Now, I don't suppose you've ever heard this before in your life. Nobody's ever said, read the instructions. Um, that would be a good thing to do as you start to run this software package, is to read the instructions. It tells you, I hope, clearly what happens. If you run this thing and you find out that there are conflicting instructions, things you don't understand, I strongly recommend you give me some feedback. Uh, I can easily change this. Note that um, actions are underlined. And those are things that you have to do. The caution, OK, so actions are underlined. Um, cautions are in red. If you screw up, it says, OK, here's what's going on. And then you're, sometimes you get some ranges. If you have, if you selected something that's out of range low, it'll turn blue. Or if it's out of range high, it'll turn red. 
Okay. In the audit section, you need audit information. And let me uh, end the show here for a little bit, and I'll go to the Excel spreadsheet. So this is what the Excel spreadsheet looks like. So the setup and instructions page is the first tab. You see where I click here on the bottom left. And you can enter the project name, address, city, state, all that sort of stuff. And for example, I would want to change this to uh, 4, 10, 14. It reformats it to say it's April 10th. Okay, and we change this to uh, webinar. Okay, now it will carry that information over to the other sheets. So you see it says now April 10th and it says webinar. Okay, this is your catch test sheet. Okay, and look at the bottom here. Oops. That's your catch test sheet. I had flipped over to the soil moisture sheet, but your catch test sheet. Okay, information carried forward here. Important things to put in here, remember, are your catch area, your catch device area, which goes in this uh, E9 box, um, and the runtime, which goes in the I9 box right there. And then you enter the individual catch values down through uh, however many you have. And note that it doesn't automatically wrap from 16 to 17. So you can put in 16 values just by entering the value and hitting the down or the enter, but then you'll have to manually come back up to 17 and put the rest in. Um, if somebody wanted to have more than 96 cans, I do have a spreadsheet that goes to 212. It looks a little funky because the formatting gets a little funny, but if that's something you wanted to do, um, let me know and I can get you a copy of that. Okay, now let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint slides. The needed audit information, first of all, catch volumes as we showed on the catch uh, sheet, the runtime, the catch device area. So the catch test looks like this, as, we, as you've already seen. And this is the same sheet that I've already shown you. Uh, and it includes the answers that it automatically calculates for you. In fact, um, what happened here? Got to go. Have a little trouble with my uh, mouse not doing what I want it to do. OK, right there is where I want to be. OK. Um, you can see if, as you're entering data, it will continue to, to uh, calculate and the numbers will change. But you'll see the number of catch devices it counts for you is 32. The number, the number it's using for the lower, lower, low quarter catch devices is 8. Gives you the volumes, calculates all of that information for you. OK. In the schedule section, and now let's end the show and go back and look at the PowerPoint. I'm sorry, the Excel. Here is the schedule section. And the information that you put in, the background information here in the heading, has been passed over. However, there's a whole bunch more information that you have to put in on this page. And this now has to do with ET values. You can select a period. For example, you can choose to do it for a week. Or if you can choose to do it for a month. And if you choose it for a month, you can pick which month it is, and it'll automatically, it knows how many days are in the month. Or if you don't like either one of those, if you any anything other than zero in the override value, it'll carry it over for however many period of days you're talking about. You put in your reference ET number here, and let's just put seven and a half in there uh, just to see what happens. And okay, it changes a whole bunch of things. Put it back down to six. That's what I have, 6.5 before. Um, OK. And uh, well, I'll walk you through the rest of the stuff. But now you have to start putting in some information that has to do with the crop or the landscape that you have. So for example, if it's turf or on the turf or plant factor, it could be a cool season or warm season grass, trees, shrubs, desert plants, grand cover, or mixed trees, shrubs. And also, you have to put in some management factor in over here. So are you looking for maximum performance, acceptable, or low maintenance kinds of performance? You tell it whether it's turf grass, low or large shrubs. And you say, well, 
what do I want to do? Do I want to be higher than average, about average, or lower than average? And what it does is it draws these out of Landscape Irrigation Auditor Manual, third edition, these values that are in the tables, multiplies them for you to get the crop coefficient, and gives you the landscape ET. Which, and this number is just the product of these times your reference ET. OK? Let's go back to presentation mode. Once we have the catch data, we can use it to schedule the irrigation for the area. And we need the following information. ET not for the reference period, your reference ET. Uh, the actual, so you need to know what, it, <coughs> what the period is, whether it's a week, a month, however it is, and need to know the actual number. And you can put those into the spreadsheet. Information about the plant, which is used to calculate the landscape coefficient, which includes the type, your management style, the density, and the microclimate, if there is any. Once you've entered all of that, those together make up the landscape coefficient, which then gives you the ET for the landscape, which is what is used then in the scheduling process. Hi, Bob. Okay, could, yeah. This is Chad. Yeah, I have a couple of questions here real quick. First of all, can this be used for the field audit portion of the certification process under CLIA? The answer is yes. Okay. Good. One more question. Where do I find my reference ET? Uh, there are sources that we should we list on the IA webpage, but uh, probably your most uh, consistent source is uh, the Extension Service in the area. There are, there are a good many uh, reference ET sources. The only caution I would give you is that if you look at an Extension uh, reference ET source. That's Cooperative Extension Service, the USDA. Uh, make sure you understand what the reference base is. A lot of agriculture will be alfalfa base, and you'll get a little different number. What you want to start with is a grass base. Good. Second question, or rather follow-up question, Bob. What does microclimate above average mean? Well, that would be something like uh, you're out in the middle of a parking lot, and you have an island with curbs, and in that island you've got some shrubs and some grass. And so in the summertime, that uh, hot pavement, that pavement will get hot, and you'll have a very distinct microclimate there. Uh, so that would be definitely an above average microclimate. On the other hand, you might have a, a uh, planting of shrubs that's uh, mostly on the north side of the house or on the shady side of the house. Uh, that would be an example of one that's below. OK. So is this always higher temperature that we're talking about? Well, it's both temperature and wind movement. Because uh, evapotranspiration is, is, is primarily driven by sun, temperature, and wind. So things that cause the wind to be calm or the temperature to be high or it to be an intense sun, uh, those will increase your ET. All right, so all the questions for now, Bob. OK. Um, then to continue with our scheduling, we need some soil information. And I know in typical landscape systems, uh, soils are not very consistent. They've probably been moved around. So you may have to do some general estimates. The Irrigation Association uses five general categories for soils. And so you can enter those cat soil categories, and immediately the infiltration rate and the available water pops up. It looks it up for that particular soil. And those are pull-down menus that you use to get to those soil types. Uh, texture category is the primary thing we look at. Uh, and the available water is set by the category. You need also to have a good estimate of your root zone depth, uh, typically in landscape turf uh, four to six inches, unless you know something different. Um, Management allowed depletion is, a, is how much you will allow the plant uh, to remove the water of available water. And typically, we allow 50%. So uh, MAD, we say, is 0.5. That's, that's a good typical value. 
And then the other thing about scheduling is whether or not watering days are dictated or can you just base it on the soil moisture scheduling and ET demands. If the city says that you can only water on alternative days or if you can only water two days a week, those are options that you can use on the soil moisture uh, or in the scheduling part on one of the pull-down sheets, and I'll show you. Uh, it significantly affects the scheduling. The sprinkler performance results that you got from the CanCatch test pass through to both the soil moisture scheduling and the uh, scheduling days schedule. Okay, so now we want to develop the soil moisture schedule. It's placed on the plants, the soil, and the system. So we put in information about the soil, we put in information about the plants, and we have done an audit on the system. And those are the things that you've already put in or pulled down from pull-out menus. And this is what it gives you. It says, okay, here are your scheduling parameters. And they're scheduling parameters, how much you need to run, and this is done per uh, station, how much you need to run per day or per scheduling period. And it gives you a summary of the schedule. And this is an example, uh, which I had shown you earlier. Now, this is a screen copy of an earlier one, so it didn't pass through that I changed this to webinar to April 10th up here. But it was for June. It was 30 days. Our reference ET for that period was 6 inches for the month. And these are the values that we selected according to what we said we were growing here with a warm season turf grass with acceptable uh, appearance and about average microclimate factor, which gives us a, a landscape ET or ETL of 3.90 or a daily average of 1.30. Okay, We have a precipitation rate which carried through from the can catch side of 1.2 inches per hour and the distribution uniformity in this particular case is 0.73, which gives us a scheduling multiplier based on an equation I've shown you of 1.19. Uh, we had selected medium textured soil, which has 0.12 uh, available water. The root zone depth was 6 inches. Uh, plant available water then is 0.72, which is just the product of those two. Our MAD is 0 0.50, so our allowable depletion is 0.36. And over here on the right side is sort of a walkthrough of how to do it. This information, this format, is the same as what's in Landscape Irrigation Auditor 3rd Edition. So it's a step-by-step -step procedure that you can do by hand. And I recommend that if you're studying for the CLIA exam, for example, that you learn to do this by hand and then run the software. Okay, your soil moisture schedule outputs, this is what you get. And for the moment, I want you to ignore that. Um, it says that our irrigation interval is every two days, and we're going to apply uh, 0.26. Remember, we had 0.13 that we carried through, so if we go every other day, we got 0.26. The lower boundary, that is the lowest you could do where the average application is equal to the plant requirement is 13 minutes. But if you multiply it by the scheduling multiplier, you get the upper boundary, which is 16 minutes. And then you need to select some value in between those. If you select a value that's low, it'll turn blue. Or if it's high, it'll turn red. And let's uh, end the show. Let's go back here and look at the spreadsheet. Um, and I'll show you that. OK, let's say that I pick 12 here. Turn blue. Okay, I picked 17, turned red. Okay, it says, hey, dummy, you're not in between the limits. Okay, and remember now that the upper boundary is the lower boundary multiplied by the scheduling multiplier and round it off. Okay, and there are some rounding rules that over here on the right. Okay, and this thing says that we need four cycle starts per day and it's going to run four minutes per cycle. Well, now, why did it say that? The reason it said that is that there are some issues here. For example, we said we were going to determine the number of cycles we needed by site conditions. So it's soil category two medium. This is carried through from your soil selection of above. 
you said you had a moderate slope, which gives it a 2. So we can pick this. Okay, If it's slight slope, see it changed to 1. But it was moderate slope, it goes to 2. Uh, no compaction, but if there was some compaction, it would change that to 1. And uh, in this particular case, I chose rotor. But if it were spray, it would also change it. Okay, And you could see when those changes get made, it changes the number of cycle starts per day. Okay, let's go back to where we were, no compaction, rotors. Okay, that says you should have four cycle starts and run four minutes per cycle. There is absolutely nothing magic about this. This is sort of general guidelines. We say that the best thing you could do would be to run the system and observe how long it takes to start run time, or runoff, and click in this value and then go on this number. Now I need to get this thing in the right zone. Uh, okay. And in this case, if we can run uh, 10 minutes before we initiate runoff, it has to have two starts per day, and it runs eight minutes each. On the other hand, if we said, well, gosh, I observed that it's 20 minutes before I get runoff, lo and behold, you only need one start. OK? Back to our presentation. So now we want to develop a watering day schedule. This is based on the plants, soil, the system, and constraints. Well, the emphasis here is on constraints. The inputs are the same, plant water requirements, sprinkler performance from the audit, uh, soil properties. And now we have some scheduling parameter constraints. And the scheduling parameter constraints are those that have been placed on us by the municipality, for example, or availability water that says that you can't run just whenever you want to. And your outputs are the same, scheduling parameters, and scheduling summary. OK, here is a watering day schedule. And uh, this, is <coughs> this is what the input sections look like. OK, it's, it's essentially the same. Uh, we would have already selected this information on the soil moisture schedule sheet. And uh, we can, those can be different. We could have changed it here. You need to make sure that you have the right values when you do it. OK, now here are the outputs. And in this particular case, we've said, I can only irrigate every third day. If I can only irrigate every third day, then my irrigation interval is three days. I need three cycle starts per day, and I'm running seven minutes per cycle. Um, and I chose a value that was in between the lower boundary and the upper boundary. Um, let's go back and look at the spreadsheet itself. You might have gotten a little bit lost here. Bob? Question, for cycle soak, is there any advantage to cycling to prevent deep percolation and not just for preventing runoff? Um, that's a good question. I think the answer is probably not, uh, because uh, the only thing, I, the only advantage I could think of is if you get some lateral redistribution that happens over time, you might get some lateral re redistribution in cycle and soak that you wouldn't see otherwise. Uh, that's the only advantage I can think of. Normally, we do cycle and soak over a short enough period of time that there, couldn't, there, there isn't time enough for evapotranspiration to occur. Thank you. OK. All right, now here is the example. Here's where we chose every third day. But here are the choices we could pick. It's daily, every other day, every third, every fourth, every fifth, or once a week. Um, and let's just change this to every other day. You'll see it changes the interval to two. Now uh, the selected runtime is out of bounds. We need to rechange our runtime. Let's make that 14, OK? And we get three starts per day, five minutes per cycle. Now, it could be that we said, all right, let's don't go by site conditions down here to give us our cycle and soak information. Let's say I know that it's 12 minutes. When I do that, it comes back to two starts per day. I recommend that when you start to use this spreadsheet, you play with it and change some numbers and see what happens with the changes and then think about what the implications of those were. Uh, very much like that question I just had, does it affect uh, deep percolation? And the truth is, I need to think about that some more. 
Okay, back to our presentation here. Now, now we're moving into a section. The first two sections that I just went through have been parts of our software that we've had available for a while, although you may not have used it. Um, the old software package that we had required that you had you macro enabled your Excel spreadsheet. And unless you're pretty good at spreadsheets, the macro enabling usually confuses folks. So the new system, the new spreadsheet we're using does not require that you macro enable. Uh, so it, these, this is an XLSX program, but the one that's posted up on the, on the web is an SL, XLS. Uh, it'll run in either versions of Excel. Okay, we talked a little bit about this before in the destination diagrams. This upper part of the, the upper half here is um, what we got for the field test, and then we are rearranged here in the bottom. Um, and you can see that it's ascending in depth from left to right. Okay, in the data analysis section, once again, we'll enter project name and location identifiers. It calculates the DU low quarter. It calculates the net precipitation rate. And then we start to look at some decisions. At this point, the scheduler manager, and now I'm talking about the person, not the software, the person can make some choices. Selecting the DU low quarter is not a choice. It's what the audit shows it should be, or, the, or that it is. Now, if you get bad DU low quarter, it, the manager should then look at what can we do to improve it. But if you say, I'm not going to change the system, I just want to manage it, then you're stuck with what it says the DU low quarter is. Okay. However, this management part of it allows the manager to look at his or her decision and see what effect it has on water usage and plant appearance and then projected plant longevity. I think generally speaking our objectives in landscape irrigation are for things to look good and that we maintain plant longevity over long periods of time uh, without stressing them and causing the plants to die. Non-uniformity is in every system. No system is perfectly uniform. Even rain. We've calculated, uh, and several people I've talked to calculated the DU low quarter for a rainstorm. And generally speaking, you're above uh, 0.85 and sometimes above 0.9, but never get 1.0. The two most important decisions the manager makes is if uh, how much inadequately watered area can I tolerate? That is, and sometimes we have to define what's inadequate. For the purposes of this webinar, I've defined that 80% of the ET landscape Anything below that is inadequate. And excessively watered area, anything that's get, that gets more than 20% more than the water needed, that is ET landscape, is excessive. So what we want to do is to try and not have any severely underwatered areas such that they look bad or they die, but not have too many overwatered areas. So here is an example. And this one is the distribution uniformity that I showed very early, where the DU is 0.59. In this particular case, I used the percentage excessively watered as 110% rather than 120%. Okay. Um, and what I've done is I've taken the individual can catch data, and this is actual data, and I've plotted it increasing from left to right. So you can see that there are several cans that had this same amount, which looks like it's about 0.16. And then there were two cans up here that had values at about, what, 0.44 or something like that. So um, the adequate area, anything that's um, above this line right here is OK. Um, I'm sorry. Um, and, yeah, let, let's get the color code straight. Anything that's above and turning blue and purple is excess. And so you see this is way excess. And you can see this is underwatered. And so generally speaking, what we try to do when we, when we choose the runtime multiplier 
is increase the run time so we decrease this area over here that's not adequately watered. When we do, we're going to increase this area over here that's excessively watered. And we'll go through some examples. Uh, here's one with better uniformity. This one's got 0.73. The one I just showed you was 0.59. This one's 0.73. And look how much flatter this line has here. And the area that's inadequately watered is 19%. And that's this area right in here, below the brown line, above the actual can-catch line. The area that's excessively watered is 34%. And that's everything that's above this purple line right here. Uh, so with improved uniformity, uh, and we set the average equal to what was needed. In other words, we ran the runtime without increasing it with the runtime multiplier. This is the results that we got. Now let's see what we have to do to get rid of this underwatered area. That is, we'll set the destination, we'll set the runtime at the upper limit. So the runtime is multiplied by the scheduling multiplier, and now we see that we have eliminated the inadequately watered area. But our excessively watered area is now 59% of it. In other words, everything from here over here, all of that is excessively watered. There is no free lunch. You can't get perfect uh, management without perfect uniformity. And perfect uniformity is not possible. But what this does is it allows you to change and, and choose numbers between the runtime lower limit and the runtime upper limit and see what impact that has and uh, what impact it has on how much water you're wasting. Now, I decided I'd give you a hypothetical example. And let's look at a distribution uniformity of 0.85, which is really very good. Uh, and this is the underwatered and overwatered areas. When I set the adequately watered area at 80% of ET and I set the runtime at the lower limit, I don't have any area that doesn't get at least 80% of our ET landscape. And I do have some that's excessively watered. It's over in here. And the reason is this curve is not quite symmetric. And I chose this as 110% as opposed to 120%. I suspect if I had changed this to 120%, so it's 20% above and 20% below, this number might be zero. OK. So what's irrigation efficiency? Generally, irrigation efficiency means that the water that's used by the plant divided by the total water that we applied. Now, the plant may use more water than it actually needs to maintain longevity and look good. Uh, that's another issue. But the water used is the total water minus excess. So even though it might not look good, it still used it. And systems with little excess are much more efficient. So the ratio of the water infiltrated and stored in the soil to the total water applied is the application efficiency. It is difficult to measure the water that's infiltrated because it's hard to bury a can catch or catch can. Hence, we generally measure the water applied, and we say, well, that's pretty close. Often, it's mistakenly used interchangeably with uniformity. Irrigation application efficiency does not mean the same thing as uniformity. And efficiency is affected by uniformity, number one. But number two, by scheduling, which we've already seen, how much do we increase the runtime? And number three, by maintenance. If we have correct timing, decent distribution uniformity, then you have application efficiency as seen in the top part of this sketch. With incorrect timing, that is, we're running it too much, we see excess water going down below the root zone, which is really not used by the plant. Here is a summary of some of the samples that I gave you before, which was if we had a DU low quarter of 0.59, uh, and we ran it at the bottom, that is, at the lower limit, we could actually get to 0.89 if 
efficiency. However, because it was non-uniform, when you ran it longer, uh, you get what's on the first line with an efficiency of 0.72 up here. Now, if we increase the uniformity, or we have higher uniformity, and uh, we run it at what was actually needed, um, we get an efficiency of 0.89. Um, and <coughs> uh, if we increase it, uh, our runtime up so that we basically eliminate the area that's inadequately watered, we drop it down to 0.79. And notice that even on this lower uniformity, even though we increased it to the upper limit, we do not eliminate the inadequately watered area, and the efficiency is still significantly less than it is with this higher uniformity. And finally, with the last one I showed you, which was the hypothetical 0.85 uniformity, we have no inadequate area, and we can get we can get efficiencies as high as 0.94. Okay, so what I've said is there's no substitute for uniformity. You can increase efficiency of a system by reducing the runtime, but the result will be increased area inadequately irrigated. And that efficiency depends mostly on uniformity, but it's affected by management decisions. And you cannot adequately irrigate and not waste water with a system with poor uniformity. I didn't intend for it to be a, a seminar on uniformity, but I guess that's the way it turns out. OK, um, questions? Hi, this is Chad Forsey again. At this point, we're going to open it up for questions. And uh, we do thank Bob for his fantastic presentation today. Um, we do have some time for questions. So if you have one, you are welcome to click the hand raise icon on your GoToWebinar dashboard, or you can simply chat it in using the chat feature to me, and I will read it to Bob. OK. Anybody have any questions? This is your opportunity. OK, I see we do have questions. All right. Where do we get a copy of the spreadsheet? Uh, I've, I'm sorry. I was remiss in putting that there uh, up on this um, uh, presentation. Uh, Chad, I think we can send out to them uh, an email to everybody who was involved and give them the web address. If you're an IA member, you can download uh, that spreadsheet. Uh, all you have to do is log in to download it. I'm sorry, I didn't put that up. Well, we'll get it to you. OK, very good. Oh, so the next question may be kind of the same. Where is this software available? I think that's the okay, same question. It's, it's available on the IA website. Uh, and you have to log in to get it, and we'll send you the URL. OK, very good. And next question again after that, I think it's the same thing. Forgot again where to download the scheduler. Assuming that's Amen. the same question, we'll, yeah. we'll send that out to you. OK. All right, can we download the slides? I, I can answer that question. Uh, what we're going to do, we have recorded the presentation today, and we will post the presentation to YouTube. And I'm going to be sending it out to everyone on the call today, as well as to all those who registered to participate in the call today, so that we can couple, uh, cover everybody who, uh, who was here and those who weren't here, and they can watch the presentation on YouTube. Next question, what criteria is used for five soil categories? Uh, it's all based on the USDA ARS um, uh, software that um, Keith Saxton did when he was with ARS in Pullman, Washington. Uh, and generally speaking, both ARS and Soil Conservation, I'm sorry, Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, have five general categories. They Depending on whose data you're looking at, it's in 12 or 13 subcategories. But we figured no more than we know about soil, five is good enough. Very good. Next question. I noticed that the chart is different on the presentation versus the downloaded Excel file chart. Can we get the same version? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I may have done some things to this that I didn't do the one that's up there, and I'll uh, yeah, I'll look at that uh, download version. Okay. We got an observant person there. Very good. All right, next question is coming from John Shields. John, I'm going to go ahead and open up the phone line, and you can ask the question. John Shields, go ahead, ask your question. This is your chance. OK. Hearing none. See if we got any more. Oh, here we go. John, John Shields, go ahead, ask your question. John Shields, are you there? Going once. Going twice. All right, and John, feel free to text that in as well. If uh, Sorry we missed you with the, uh, with the actual call here. OK. I believe that's all the questions we have for now on the screen that I'm seeing. And um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out today with a brief update on government affairs at the state level, as I typically do. And I um, don't want to talk for a long time today, but just want to briefly highlight a letter that the Irrigation Association recently sent to Governor Jerry Brown of California. And in this letter, we thanked the governor for his recent state of emergency proclamation on drought, which is uh, in, uh, in a very significant state right now throughout the state of California. And as a part of that letter, we suggested to the governor that as he and other state officials discuss water use in coming days, to please consider promoting incentives and exemptions for landscape irrigation system installation, maintenance, and use for the following efficient practices. Number one is hiring a qualified in irrigation professional for irrigation system installation and maintenance, and that these qualified individuals include irrigation professionals certified by the IA's Select Certified Program and California State Licensed Landscape Contractors. Number two, installing efficient irrigation products and technologies, such as drip irrigation, microspray irrigation, and irrigation smart controllers labeled by the US EPA's WaterSense program. And number three, having an irrigation system audited for distribution uniformity and checked for underground leaks, and if necessary, systems should be repaired by qualified irrigation professionals. So these are our three mitigating categories that we are asking the governor and state officials in California to consider when they also consider drought restrictions uh, responding to the significant drought in the state of California. So I wanted to mention that briefly, make everybody aware of it, and furthermore state that these mitigating factors are being considered uh, for use in other states where we are encountering drought restrictions either taking place or being considered. And if you are in a state where you're running into drought restrictions and you would like more information about promoting mitigating factors, you can let me know and I'll be happy to work with you. And I see we have a couple more questions here. So quickly I want to address those. The certification instructions state that original paperwork must be submitted, faxes and copies not accepted. But can these be printed and sent with this software? Bob. Yes, you can print it and send it. Now, uh, you might want to check. Uh, we, we do have a intentional disconnect between education and certification. Uh, I think when they say the original paperwork must be permitted, must be submitted, you have to submit a piece of paper that shows that you have written the amounts, for example, your catch volume amounts. But I believe um, that you can do the calculations and submit a copy, a printed copy of the calculation sheet. So you can simply, uh, on the CanCatch test sheet, uh, go to that and and print that, and uh, it will show you, it will show the catch values, the DU low quarter, and the PR. Good. Okay, and. And I've got a question here. Can we get a copy of the letter to California we'd like to use in similar situations in our state? Yes, Jake. I see you, Jake. Please send me an email to chad, C-H-A-D, chad at irrigation.org. That's chad at irrigation.org. And I will respond with a copy of the letter. I'm happy to do that. OK, next question. I was asked by a client 
to provide an irrigation design that was 80% uniformity. How do I do that in design? Yes. Is that question to me? Yes, that's to you, Bob. Um, I think the only thing, it, I'd be really hesitant to say that I could develop a system that would give you, and I assume they mean 0 0.80 DU low quarter. Um, the only thing you can do is design the best system you can you can get based on manufacturer's data and several sources of predicted uh, distribution uniformity. Uh, there's one that's out of uh, CIT at Cal State Fresno, uh, but the manufacturers also have these. Uh, but I would suppose that they want it audited, and you submit an audit that says it does what I said it would do. Uh, and in that case, uh, I'd run the system at night when there was no wind. Uh, you got to document everything you did um, and hold your breath, because that's awful good distribution uniformity. OK. OK, very good. All right, not seeing any further questions. So at this point, I would like to thank everybody for participating today. And we've got a couple of questions about copies of the webinar. We are posting this webinar in its entirety to YouTube. And I will send a link out to all of you, as well as all those who registered to attend and were not able to participate today, so that they can view the webinar, watch it again, and, uh, and gain a better understanding of what we talked about. Um, so again, thank you very much, Bob. One, one final comment, and I, I appreciate all those who are thanking us for the webinar today. Hey, we're happy to do it, and, uh, and as members, you are why we do what we do. So thank you for coming. Bob, if, and this is a question here, and this comes from Jake Mathry. Jake, I hope, I say your, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Bob, if you would like to discuss deep percolation, I would love to give my insight. OK, sure. All right. uh, Jake, send me, drop me an email, and, and we can exchange contact information. I'm bob at irrigation.org. OK, thanks again, everybody. We wish you a great day, and we'll see you on our next webinar, which you will receive in your email soon. Thanks again, and take care.